And thanks to the ehlers Donlow Society for having me, and thank you guys for, for hanging in there. So I'm gonna talk about deconditioning, and certainly it affects people who are older, but it actually affects everybody if we are inactive. And so it applies to everybody, not just older people. And older people don't have to become deconditioned um, if they take actions to stay, stay healthy. Okay, this is me, um, as Claire said, Professor of Physical Therapy. Okay. okay, so hopefully by the end of the session, you'll be able to define deconditioning, identify some of the potential roadblocks, because we know we should be exercising, but it's hard. Um, and roadblocks may be due to hypermobility, POTS, or MCAS. And I'll talk about some of the ways that we can potentially overcome those roadblocks and reverse deconditioning. Level of evidence warning here, there's not a lot of research on hypermobility and exercise. So I've used what I could find in applied literature from other conditions. So a definition of deconditioning, changes in the body due to inactivity or decreased activity. Um, and it involves the muscles, hearts, and lungs. We kind of all know that. But hopefully by now you've heard enough about the autonomic nervous system to understand that that's super important. And it also becomes deconditioned. And it has to learn its job properly. Deconditioning can make you feel weak. It decreases your tolerance to activity. We define it as having three stages. So mild is when you can't do your normal, more vigorous type exercise. Moderate is when you can't do normal daily activities, walking, shopping, chores. And then severe is when you're unable to do even minimal self-care activities. So what are the symptoms? Feeling weak and tired, being short of breath with minimal physical activity, having your heart rate go up more than it should for the amount of activity that you're doing, pain or discomfort with activity, decreased strength, endurance and balance, difficulty doing your usual exercise and difficulty doing normal daily activities. So some of the benefits of physical activities, and this isn't gonna be surprising, we know we should be exercising, so decreased prevalence of a lot of medical conditions. Um, also depression and anxiety, um, decreased incidence of falls, which is super important in our population because falling is not good for us when we're fragile to begin with and decrease in pain sensitivity. And we call that nociplastic changes. And you've heard about pain sensitization already, where the nervous system becomes sensitive. It's like a volume knob that just increases the volume on any musculoskeletal pain that you have. And being sedentary makes your nervous system sensitive to pain. It's turning the volume knob up. So regular exercise can help to turn that volume knob down if it's the appropriate exercise for you. And exercise can help increase your physical and cognitive function. We're learning that mental function is, responds very well to physical act, exercise, your general well-being, sleep, and quality of life. There we go. So we know we should be exercising. Why don't we? Well, there are roadblocks. It's hard. Um, it's hard for a bunch of reasons. So why do zebras in particular not exercise? Well, pain due to hypermobility, dysautonomia symptoms, so postural symptoms being upright, fatigue, exercise intolerance. Um, exercise intolerance is reported in about 80% of people who have both hypermobility and POTS. And so if you just don't have the energy or you don't tolerate it well, you're not going to exercise. We know that people who are hypermobile and also have dysautonomia are more likely to be sedentary, so they're more likely to become deconditioned. They're more likely to respond to an injury by becoming sedentary, and they're more likely to experience post-exertional malaise. And I'll define that term in a bit. That's something we associate with myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome, but it affects a lot of people, particularly with POTS. And we know that mass, or we know from anecdotal evidence that exercise can provoke mass cell symptoms. Um, there's not a lot of research on that, but certainly a lot of people report that exercise can aggravate their mass cell. 
OK, so what can we do about the pain? We'll take each of those problems in order. So making sure we're doing the right exercises in the right order correctly. So people with hypermobility have poor proprioception. That means your body may go places where it shouldn't go, and you could injure yourself through overuse or through trauma. So making sure you're doing proprioceptive or body awareness exercises and motor control exercises before you try to do strengthening or stabilization. If you're in bad alignment and you're moving your joints, it's going to be painful. It's going to stress the tissues more than it should. And making sure that you're doing exercises that are appropriate for you at your current level of fitness. We also may need to calm the central nervous system. Remember that volume knob? And we may need to turn the volume knob down. We can do that through breathing, meditation, biofeedback. Emily Rich covered a lot of those options in her presentation, her excellent presentation earlier today. So we want to try to decrease the central, nerve, central sensitization um, so that that volume knob is not amplifying the pain that we have. And it turns out that these Techniques to calm the central nervous system can also decrease inflammation. So normally we think of sensory nerves bringing information into the spinal cord and brain, but when the central nervous system is hypersensitive, those nerves fire backwards and release inflammatory chemicals into the body. And so calming the central nervous system can de decrease peripheral sensitivity or decrease inflammation, widespread inflammation. And there are other strategies to decrease systemic inflammation through diet, exercise, and medications. This clicker's not working great for me. OK. So what are some of the challenges that POTS causes with exercise? Well, the fatigue makes it difficult to start. When you're exhausted, it's hard to get out and exercise. Orthostatic intolerance symptoms will also make exercise uncomfortable. Heat intolerance, inappropriate autonomic response to exercise, and that post-exertional malaise that I'll get to. So what can we do to address the symptoms of POTS? And you had some excellent presentations on this this morning, so I'm not going to go into details, but decreasing fatigue so you have the energy to exercise. Um, start low, go slow, so don't try to do too much. If you don't have a good healthcare provider working with you on fatigue, the Newcastle Fatigue Self-Management Booklet has a lot of suggestions that you can see if you can incorporate. And then managing symptoms during exercise through your usual POTS self-care strategies. And I won't go into those in detail because you've heard about that already. This is a chart by Strassheim um, that just organizes the information for managing fatigue with POTS. So there's avoiding aggravating factors, things like dehydration, extreme heat, standing for too long. There are the physical things that you can do to manage it through fluid, exercise, compression, um, and positioning, pharmacological interventions, um, psychological support, and then if you're working or in school, accommodations may help. So this is an interesting graph. So the blue line represents a, a normal person. The red line is somebody whose vagus nerve's not functioning properly. So that's dysautonomia, a form of dysautonomia. And when the, and you can think of the, the height of the line as, as your um, response to exercise. It's the heart rate that they're monitoring. And at rest at the beginning on the left side of the chart, you can see that the healthy individual has a lower heart rate, which is healthier. It shows that they have better balance between autonomic and uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity or nervous systems. But, and their sympathetic nervous system is activated with exercise. And that's normal. The sympathetic nervous system is important. We don't want to always suppress it. We just don't want it to always be dominant. And so exercise should activate the sympathetic nervous system. But then you can see in the blue line, it should drop back down within a minute or two after you finish exercising. Um, the red line, which is somebody with dysautonomia, the heart rate's higher to begin with. It means that the, the nervous system, autonomic nervous system, is not balanced. The heart rate doesn't go up as high as it should. So you're going to have fatigue with exercise because you're not getting enough blood around. And the heart rate stays higher, which shows that you're not responding afterwards, your system is not calming back down. And that's probably one of the reasons why people are exhausted when they exercise is that they're not going through the recovery stage. So maybe we can hack the autonomic nervous system. And this is kind of based on bits and pieces. There's not good evidence. 
But if the failure of the sympathetic nervous system to activate, remember, it's got to go up so that you can exercise. If it's not activating when you exercise, can we hack it and try to get it to go up? And a couple of strategies might include breathing. So there's some yoga breathing, the shining, skull shining breathing, or right nostril breathing that is shown to increase sympathetic activity. Maybe you can kick your sympathetic nervous system into gear a little bit and you can exercise better. And then if fatigue afterwards is caused by the parasympathetic nervous system not kicking in, maybe we can activate that. And Emily went through a whole bunch of excellent techniques for activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And maybe if we do some of these things at the end of our exercise, we can help our body with the recovery process so that we can feel better and not be exhausted. Post-exertional malaise. So this word cloud probably sounds familiar to you. Exhaustion, difficulty thinking, clearly muscles, pains, and aches. So these are very common symptoms in post-exertional malaise. And it often coexists with dysautonomia, and they're classic um, in myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, which often coexists with dysautonomia. Um, so definition of post-exertional malaise is having an excessively bad response to exercise, usually 12 to 48 hours later, and it can last for days or weeks. So if you're one of those people who tries to exercise and then you're on the couch for a week, this may be you. Um, and I have the criteria for myalgic encephalitis CFS there, um, that profound fatigue, post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, trouble thinking clearly, and orthostatic intolerance. So there's a lot of overlap with um, dysautonomia and hypermobility. So what can we do about that? Well, activity management and pacing so that you avoid overdoing it. Uh, and again, Emily had some great strategies for that as well. Stress management so that your sympathetic nervous system is not chronically active and exhausting you. And doing a cool down to help activate your parasympathetic nervous system at the end of your exercise. So gentle, easy movement, maybe some of that slow diaphragmatic breathing, maybe massaging your ears. Um, but for people who have post-exertional malaise, exercise does need to be implemented very carefully because some people just do not respond well to doing too much exercise, and too much may be really very little. Mast cell activation and exercise, so there's not much research on it, but we do know that exercise releases histamine, which is the mast cell mediator, one of the mast cell mediators. But histamine is actually important in exercise because it helps to increase blood flow into the muscles, which you need for the muscles to be active. Um, and it helps to improve capillary permeability, so there's nutrient exchange in the muscles and it helps to the muscles to actually become stronger. It's part of what triggers the strengthening response with exercise. Um, we do know that H1, H2 blockers are often used to treat mast cell activity, but we don't know how that impacts the natural way that muscles get stronger. And that's something that we need to um, go into, or we need to learn more about it. So what can we do about mast cell activity? Managing the triggers, minimizing the triggers, during exercise, exercising in a cool environment, toweling off sweat, because sweat's often an aggravating factor. Um, and we don't know about pre-dosing with MCAD medications. I've heard it recommended that, oh, if you're going to go running, if you can run, then you know, take your antihistamine first. And I, I don't think the science is there yet. OK, so how, about, how can you start an exercise program, especially if you're really deconditioned now? So you may need some pre-participation screening to make sure it's safe. You want to decide on your goals. Which of these things do you want to accomplish? That may determine what kind of exercises you're going to do. And you want to figure out how to start, where to start, so that you don't overdo it at the beginning. This is a, called the 2020 PAR-Q. It's a pre-participation screening. Um, so if you haven't been screened for wellness by your, one of your providers, this is a set of questions. If you answer yes to all of them, you probably should talk to your doctor before you start a new exercise program. And you can access that on the website. Measuring aerobic exercise intensity. So heart rate's not always a great indicator, especially if you have POTS, if you're taking a POTS medicine or anxiety medicine that suppresses your heart rate. So using the rate of perceived exertion is a good way to tell if you're exercising at the right intensity. And for people who are really deconditioned, 
just starting out, we recommend starting at maybe a two or three out of 10. So start gently. Those are based on guidelines for fibromyalgia, which is the closest thing I can um, have for, for hypermobility. Okay, so let's say you are completely sedentary, um, maybe even chair bound. Where could you start? So here's something that I came up with. There's no evidence for this, but right now today maybe commit to putting 15 minutes a day into it. We can all find 15 minutes. Um, in the first week, maybe just start with breathing exercises, right? That breathing is an exercise. It does involve core stabilization. You have to be able to breathe correctly and well to exercise. And who can't breathe for five minutes, okay? Or singing, loud singing. It turns out that forceful singing can be as good an exercise as brisk walking on a treadmill for people who are very deconditioned, especially if you have orthopedic problems in your legs um, that you can't walk or bike, try singing. It's a good way to start at least, and it's a lot of fun Well, for some people. Um, next week, maybe two units of five minutes of singing and one working on postural correction, just being in the correct alignment because you don't want to exercise if you're not in the right alignment. The next week, Maybe start working on a little bit of posture strengthening. And what you do will depend on what your postural issues are. I'm not going to give you specific exercises, but five minutes of gentle posture exercises. Next week, maybe one unit of five minutes of the breathing or singing, five minutes of posture, five minutes of core strengthening. This is super, super slow, but this is what some people need to be able to do it safely. Um, and then gradually adding in maybe five minutes of core. Because some people think it's like, oh, I got to do you know, 20 minutes for it to be meaningful. And that's not true. If you have a flare day or a flare week, back up a week or two and then try to progress back in. So here's some resources if you want more about what postural correction might mean, what core strengthening might mean, about how to progress exercises, some resources for you. And my scientific references. And thank you very much for listening.